And now, I invite Professor Mary Evans to kindly deliver her lecture. Thank you all very much um, for the invitation to me to come and speak here this morning and to Dr. Izam for making the arrangements that have made today's meeting possible. I hope you can all hear me and I hope as well that you will forgive me for giving this lecture entirely in English. The English do not have a good reputation in terms of, of learning other people's languages. And so I'm afraid I follow in that appalling tradition. However, having said that, um, it is a pleasure to be here. It is a pleasure to be taking part in a truly international discussion of the ways in which gender is developing and changing in the 21st century. What I want to say this morning, what I want to talk about, will be very much related to the experiences of changing expectations of gender in the United Kingdom. But I want to offer this as a way of thinking about the possibilities of how change in this context is also happening elsewhere. So, I also want to say, and this is not about the substance of my lecture, but about the discussion that might emerge from it, that I gather that there will be an opportunity later in the morning for questions and uh, for you to have the opportunity to make your points, to ask your questions. And so I do very much hope that we'll, we will be able to open up this discussion at a later date. So, what I want to talk about this morning is going to fall into three parts. I want to talk, first of all, about the ways in which the idea of citizenship and the citizen has changed in the United Kingdom over the past 200 years. And I, I want to emphasize, first of all, that for a very long time, in our legal and political system, there was no understanding of any other gender than that of the masculine and the male. The legal system, the political system, was, was written literally in terms of the he, the him. So if you read a great deal of English law, if you read indeed a great deal of English academic work until very recently, you will find that the person, the person who is the human subject in that work, is a male person. Let me put before you one sentence from an anthropology textbook published in the United Kingdom in the 1970s. And that textbook begins with the sentence, people in all societies have wives. Now, just consider that sentence for a few moments. People in all societies have wives. What does this give us in terms of how we think about the gender of the citizen, the nature of the person that we are, are thinking about? And it's that shift and it's that change which I think has been the most important in terms of the last 100 years in the United Kingdom. We've come to understand that citizens come in two genders. So over the past 100 years, we've taken all kinds of steps to make it clear that the citizen is a person who comes as both male and female. And with that goes a further understanding, which has truly changed and revolutionized, I think, our thinking about citizenship. 
the ways in which we construct the rights and the obligations of citizens. It's at that point that we start to enter into the place where we rewrite access to voting, access to consumer rights, access to education, access to participation in politics. All these things start to change. They didn't change rapidly in the United Kingdom. They changed very slowly. They changed as a result of struggle, of politics, of campaigning, of argument, of furious resistance of both men and women. And if you look at the politics of gaining the vote for women in the United Kingdom in the late 19th, early 20th century, you'll find that there were both men and women saying, if you give women the vote, they'll no longer be able to have children. If you give women the vote, they'll no longer be able to be good wives and mothers. If you give women the vote, the country will fall apart. Um, whether or not you think that last point has occurred, of course, is a matter of opinion. But the point is that the resistance, it was not an easy battle. It was not something which occurred without argument and without <coughs> discussion. But I also want to say, and this is something which reflects the comments that were made in introducing me, that the path to voting and the path to citizen, citizenship, and I think voting is a really fundamental part of citizenship, I think without voting, the be, being able to express your view in a political system, there is no real <coughs> citizenship. It doesn't exist. It was always very closely connected in the United Kingdom to property. So what's important to realise, just as a just as a historical point, is that for a very long time in the United Kingdom, in fact up to 1928, voting rights for both men and women were linked to property. So we, just, we can't go away with thinking just the simple fact that men all had the vote and no women didn't. It's not simple. It wasn't simple like this. It was much more complicated. And lots of men, until certainly 1918, didn't have the vote either. So bear that in mind, because I think it does make a difference to the ways in which we think about the history of citizenship. And it does show us that it was a long and complicated struggle. So. To move, not too rapidly, but at least to move into the 20th century. Um, always an important point to keep moving on. So in the 20th century, what we find occurring as far as the history of gendered relations and the history of gender in the, in the United Kingdom is that gradually, <coughs> very, very gradually, more and more extensions are made to what citizens should expect to have, be they male or female. And I think one of the really important battles, which is sometimes not talked about very much in the 21st century because we take it so much for granted in the United Kingdom, is what I think we would describe as rights to personal autonomy and freedom the right to be an equal party in divorce, the right to have equal rights over children, the right to access to medical care, to contraception, to abortion. These are aspects of personal autonomy which had to be gradually arrived at over the course of the 20th century. And again, they were the result of struggle. But again, and again I think it, we need to realise this, it was also a struggle in which very often men and women were on the same side. So feminism, yes, is a very valid and was a very important political tradition. But at the same time, it was also a tradition in which a lot of men took part. 
and it was clearly very much in the interests of people, be they male or female, to see the importance of allowing people to limit their families, allowing women to have medical care. All these kinds of things have come, and this is where we leap to the 21st century, to constitute what we think of not just as women's rights, but as human rights. And that shift, I think, is a truly, truly important one. A really, really important idea in thinking. That there aren't just rights for men, rights for women. There are human rights. And human rights are rights to which everybody should have access. And those rights, of course, are rights about voting, about education, and about this crucial, crucial aspect of human existence, which is autonomy. And I want to emphasise autonomy because I think it's a very important part of the human condition, the human condition being male or female. And autonomy, just think about what autonomy is. It means the right to make decisions for yourself. It doesn't mean, if we say this, that you make decisions without thinking about other people. It's not a prescription for selfishness or self-interest, but it is a right to be able to say, I think this, I want to do this. And it has big political implications, but it has also everyday implications, in which, of course, it means I have a right to walk about freely in public. I should have a right to choose who I meet with, who I socialise with, what I say to people in public. Autonomy is being able to move about, to act, to make decisions about being a person in the modern urban space in which increasing numbers of us live. It's not about saying, you can do that if you're a man, but you can't do that if you're a woman. It's about saying autonomy, the, as the access to choice, the access to physical movement and engagement is something which all people should be able to share. And of course, that also has implications for what happens in the private space. Because yes, we can talk about access to being in public freely without being threatened, without being frightened. But there's also an aspect to autonomy, which is about being able to make decisions in the home about whose voice in the home is the most powerful. And it's about saying there should be no powerful voice in the home. The home, domestic relations, personal relations, should be relations of equality. And that, I think, is a really important step that we took and are, take and are continuing to take. I don't want to suggest in making these remarks that we have achieved anything that constitutes real equality in this context. But I do want to say that this seems to me an area in which we can think about, or we should think about, moving and developing all the time. So, where we get to in the 21st century is another point which I think is something we should think about this morning. And I think it's two things here which I want to say something about. And it takes me to this issue of what a respectable citizen, what a respectable woman is. Now, I have memories of my grandparents, my grandmother, and so on, and I, as everybody in this room has, any, anybody who's grown up in a family has memories of their family's past. Now, my grandmother, my grandmother's view of her role in life, she had seven children. Um, 
not uncommon in the age in which she lived. Her view was that she kept house, she kept house for her husband and those seven children, and the girls helped in the house while the boys worked in the family business. It, it was a kind of model of patriarch, the, a patriarchal family. My grandmother would not leave the house without wearing a hat. That started to disappear in the 1960s, just before she died. But as I remember her in the 1950s, I go back that far, this hat was a famous piece of her, the way that she dressed. And grandmother's hat was a kind of example of the difference between grandmother and mother. So generations change. Generations shift in terms of what it is accepted and what is respectable. But my grandmother never expected to be able to be, or wanted to be, or anyway had any time to be, in paid work. So what changed between my grandmother's generation and my mother's generation was that idea that it was perfectly okay for married women to have access to paid work. Now this is the real difference. This is something which really occurs in Britain. Because up to 1947 in the UK, a f and this is a fact, it's not a fake fact, as people talk about <laughs> today. It's a real fact, a very real fact, which made a difference to a lot of people's lives. Um, married women were barred from, from working in public, public work, public, the public sphere in the UK up until 1947. So if you were a teacher or a doctor or a civil servant or you had a job in any of these contexts and you got married, that was it. If you were a woman, you were out. Now just consider that. I mean, this... Uh, when I tell my students this, they look at me as if I'm making things up, you know, as if I've suddenly fabricated um, another extraordinary fact about the past um, that they find difficult to understand. The, but the point is that, that that was the case, and it changed. So what you see in this, after 1947, is increasingly the idea that married women should be able to be in paid work. It's okay, it becomes respectable. Women are no longer accused, publicly at least, of abandoning their homes, leaving their children to look after themselves, not cooking their husband's suppers, all this kind of thing. So you get a new discussion about the home. You get a new discussion about domestic life. It's okay for wives, and this is the important thing, to be out there in paid work. It was always okay, I have to emphasize, for unmarried women to be in paid work. And certainly until the beginning, until 1939, many, many unmarried English women worked in the homes of other people. They were in domestic service. However, once you say it's okay for women to be, married women to be in paid work, you then start to set up all kinds of social issues. Uh, and I think it's these social issues where we need to start to think about what then we make respectable. And we also need to think about the social implications of this change. Because one of the things that changes is, of course, if married women are expected, not just allowed, but expected to be in paid work, how does this relate to two things? First of all, how does it relate to life within the family? What does it do to domestic life, to family relationships? And secondly, what does it do and what do societies have to think about in terms of alternative forms of non-familial care? Basically, who looks after the children, who looks after the elderly, who looks after the sick? 
So if you look at all, country, all the countries of Europe, all these countries, not just the UK, have had to engage in thinking about the public organisation of care. And this is, I think, hugely, hugely important. It's very much where we are in the UK at the moment. It's having an enormous impact on our economy. We have an elderly population. The UK is a very different place to India demographically. We're very old and you're very young, or in terms of your population at any rate. So you have an elderly population who is going to care for this population? Who is going to care for the children in this population? How does this actually relate to what we think about in terms of the respectable <coughs> citizen? So, so to go back to where I started, I started with the idea of expanding the idea of citizenship. Okay, so you, you start to think not just about the he, the world as a masculine place, but you start to think of the world as a, a place which has two genders in it, male and female. You start to make all kinds of changes which really revolutionise revolutionize people's <coughs> lives in many ways. Women get more education, women acquire a sense of autonomy. And I can't emphasise enough how important I think that idea is. Autonomy and independence, I think, are absolutely fundamental to human existence. It's not that we should be separate. It's not that we should be just about ourselves. But it's about we should have rights as individuals to movement, to expression, to making social relationships. This is absolutely crucial to where we should be. But at the same time as we're doing that, what is that, what is the social impact of that set of ideas? And what are we going to say as well in terms of what are we going to put together in terms of organizing a world in which we still all, every one of us in this room and of every room in the planet, at some point in our lives, we need to be cared for, whether we're young or old or sick or whatever else it happens to be. So if we move from a world, this is, this is the point I really want to get over. If we move from a world in which a great deal of what we might think about generally as care takes place within a domestic setting with a highly gendered division of responsibility for care. If we move from that place to a place where we expect all members of the world in which we live to be engaged in the public world, how are we then going to incorporate into that public world the kinds of structures and strategies which make it possible for the world to go on in the way that it does. So we need, as people have been saying for the last 40 years, every society needs to reproduce itself. It can't go on any longer with, without that. But social reproduction is not just about producing babies. About having a next generation. It's also about what we do and how we care for those that next generation. So the question that we have to look at then is how are we caring for that next generation and how are we caring for that generation as it gets older. So emphasis then on care, emphasis on that need for care and the ways in which this has got to recognise that the ways in which men and women relate to each other have vastly changed. We no longer expect in the UK, I think it's taken for granted, at least publicly, 
Though lots of people obviously in, in private will dissent and say they don't like it like this or they don't want it like this. But the public idea is that within the family, social relations are relations of equality. There shouldn't be different expectations about who does what. Domestic life, care for children, is shared. Children don't just have mothers, they have parents, and that's a shift. A shift in the narrative of family life, which is very important. So care becomes something which is about parents and not just about mothers. So we're doing that, we're changing all these kinds of expectations. And it's in many ways a period, I think, in at least the history of the UK in 2019, which is an extremely interesting and an extremely important one. Because we are actually rethinking and remaking some of the scripts, some of the ideas about gender. What, what we are doing most importantly, and this again is a really, really important idea, is that I think we are moving away from the idea that certain kinds of behaviour, certain kinds of aptitude are natural and go with biological gender. So that denaturalization of gender is the point which I think is the point for the 21st century. We're not any longer saying, OK, she's a woman, so she can do caring. Thank you. Or he's a man, so he doesn't ha have to think about the shopping or the children or etc., etc., any of those things. The concept is denaturalization. It's about, OK, we recognize that both men and women can be educated, are intellectual competence is similar but the next the really big step in all this is denaturalizing our expectations of gender and saying okay we're all people we've all got human capaci capacities but we shouldn't actually assume any longer that some of these capacities only belong either to men or to women so Denaturalization is a really radical shift in our thinking. And I'm always interested and very much impressed as well by how fast this change has come about. I really do think that this rate of change is something which is for many people still difficult to understand and to appreciate. Um, when I was growing up, um, I didn't wear a hat. I didn't have to wear a hat. My grandmother wore the hat. I didn't have to. But there were things that girls did and that, boy, that boys did. There was a very, very famous English children's book or series of books published in the 1950s called The Janet and John Readers. You may have come across Janet and John. Janet is always helping Mummy with the washing up, but John has gone to help Daddy mend the car. Now, Janet and John, that world of Janet and John is precisely the world which I think is being increasingly questioned. It's an exercise in deconstructing naturalised concepts of gender. So when children's books are written these days, and I'm sure that you've come across some of the recent ones, about um, very, very active young, young girls, um, girls who are flying to space, flying the aeroplanes, fixing the car, driving the motorbikes, etc., etc. The world is being shifted in terms of expectations and ideas about gender. And that's where we are, in fact, I think, in February 2019. So, citizenship, ideas about the res the res who the respectable woman is, have radically changed. That's the first thing. 
it's not necessarily respectable to stay at home, look after your home. It is not, it's not that it isn't perfectly okay as a choice. I'm not suggesting that for a moment. That's the choice, that's part of what autonomy should be about. If anybody wants to do that, then that should be exactly what they're able to choose to do. But it hasn't got the weight of social, of, of, of a social value. It's not a moral imperative. That's the point which I think we have to understand. That the assumption that that's what women do as a moral imperative connected with being female is what has changed. So that's the first thing. We become, we can be respectable in different ways by contributing to the social world, by taking part in social and political life. That's point number one. The second thing is the shift towards the expectation of the autonomy of women. And again, I can't emphasize that highly enough. I think it's fundamental. And the third thing is the point that I've been talking about um, in most recently, the point about denaturalizing expectations of gender. And that's something which, again, is a work in progress. It's not something, certainly, which has been necessarily brought about, but it is, I think, a way in which many people are moving and starting to think. As, and certainly there are social reasons for this. Manual work in many countries is becoming, manual strength is becoming less important. All kinds of things are changing in the social world so that the sheer strength which might have been necessary in the past is no longer relevant, etc., etc. There are good reasons for these changes. But one of the, I think, most important reasons is not just those changes, but the idea behind them, which is that there is no real basis, in fact, uh, for the idea that certain kinds of aptitudes, possibilities, responsibilities necessarily lie with either men or women. The citizen, if you like, has become neutral. I started off by arguing, and I think, well, I can refer you to a dozen millions, indeed, a great deal of literature which points out that in the, up until the beginning of the 20th century, the citizen was gendered. The citizen is no longer gendered. So we've reached that neutrality. So the next step, and where we will go on, I hope, is thinking about how we can implement that neutrality. It's not about neutering gender. It's not about taking away gender. But it's about neutralizing and denaturalizing the social impact <coughs> Of, bi of, of biological difference. So that's where I'm going to stop this morning. Um, as I said when I started these remarks, I very much hope